So I'd like to welcome up the first speaker this afternoon, Alexandra Moran. Um, I'll let you give your official army title because I've already forgotten it. Hello and welcome. I'm Cadet Alexandra Moran. I've seen some of you I was talking to you earlier on the stand today. Uh, before I start, has anybody applied for the general service or cadetship yet? No. Um, yeah, so I am the 95th cadet class and I'm currently the class captain. Um, that means I'm pretty much the class president for the class. So that's why I'm talking to you today. Um, I am, it, the cadet itself is 15 months long. It's uh, robust. There's um, a lot of uh, strict discipline to it as well. But um, you get a, seven, a level 7 uh, defense leadership and management degree from it, um, as well as uh, a lot of military experience and experience in life. So the um, for the start, stage one, you know, a little bit about myself actually, I'm, I'm in the army six years. I started as a general recruit in 2012. Um, I've been overseas in Lebanon in 2016. And uh, from that, I gained a vast amount of knowledge about uh, defense forces, uh, military experience. And from there, I decided I want to be more of a, take, take more of a command role, more of a leadership, and join the cadetship. Um, I was also a rank of corporal beforehand. But uh, the cadetship itself, uh, stage one, would be your military socialization. So for that, you'd have uh, how to carry weapons, uh, fire weapons, um, general uh, acting on words of command. Um, from there, it's uh, more uh, robust and strict discipline. Um, you'd be kept in for most of it for, the, I'd say, four months from October when it starts until you have um, until Christmas, I'd say. So you get off for Christmas then after that. But after that then you have stage two, so it's where your development stage. Then you become um, more of a leader in your section. Um, so we have sections, platoons, companies. But you become more of a leader there and uh, you develop more skills on how to uh, lead people, um, think for yourself, uh, show more initiative, and it, for more for uh, commanding other troops. From there, you start doing uh, MIT, so how to give classes, how to um, teach on the, the weapons you've just been taught in previous uh, service. And then moving on, then you get other uh, chances. Then there's there's less less uh, strict environments, so you get more time off in the evening times, more time off in the weekends uh, to participate in sports or any kind of interest you have at the time. Um, after that, then you have your you hit a summer leave block, and you have a, another stage then afterwards where they develop you as instead of a section commander, more of an officer. So from there you become a, your platoon commander training. So in platoon commander training, then you will be doing um, roles then in kind of I star places or for uh, surveillance target reconnaissance and uh, things like that. So um, yeah, during that time you get a little bit more time off, and uh, you get to participate then in other things like uh, currently we're going to uh, Lords in a couple of weeks, and uh, we're going to a military pilgrimage. Uh, we're also uh, competing against other cadets from other countries like Sandhurst, uh, the British, and we're competing against them, and uh, just plenty of things like that we're going to be doing. Uh, the application process for going to join, which I'd say this is the main point today. Application process would, it, it currently takes probably four months. So you start off by applying online, military.ie. Then you'll, um, you'll go along to do the, your psychometric testing, which would be online. After that, they'll call you in. Maybe it'll probably take probably a month to process everyone. Call you in then, and you will be, um, you go through another psychometric to prove that you actually doing it and a fitness test. So the fitness test will comprise of 20 push-ups in a minute, 20 sit-ups in a minute, and a mile and a half run. I think mile and a half run is 16 minutes. All doable. It's just to prepare you for the next stage where you have to go through the robust military training. After that then you have a group assessment, so how well you can work in your team, and what the Defence Force itself are looking for. So you're showing your team working skills, you're showing uh, your ability to think for yourself, 
and how well you can carry out, uh, you can take instruction and process information. So and then after that, you have another interview where they test your competencies and what kind of traits of a person you are and how, the, how you be fitted to the job. Um, then you'll have your medical and then again, you'll be offered a place in cadetship. Have any, any questions on the application process? Oh, to apply, you, you've been in the age bracket for cadets is 18 to 26. For a naval cadet, it would be 18 to 27. And for general service, is 18 to 25. So that's, uh, it's, a, it's a young crowd, but what, what we're looking for is a length of time in service. If you're an older person, no, an older person, you'd have, um, you'd, like, you wouldn't get a whole lot of terms of service out for the training that you're putting in. And, um, just so you can do your job. It's a very it's a very physical, robust job, and people of older ages tend not to be. I know they feel feel young at heart, but they're not uh, the same as robust. Any other questions on that? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to introduce Sublesem Multi. Hi there, uh, my name's uh, Sovletan Darren Utley, and as you can tell from the different rig, uh, I'm a member of the Irish Naval Service. Uh, I'm an uh, officer serving now, just going on seven years. Uh, just basically, kind of, what's my purpose here today to talk to you about is kind of my experience of the Irish Naval Service, what the Irish Naval Service does, and potentially, would you like to join the Navy, and can I get you to join the Navy? So basically, in 2012, I joined the Naval Service as an operations cadet. I would have been sent to the Curra, uh, like uh, Cadet uh, Alex here, and uh, I done three months there, kind of introduction military training. So that's kind of your foot drill, learn to fire a rifle. Um, I got to dress up and put on face paint as well and go crawling through, uh, through bushes and the type of stuff that uh, the army would more specialise in. My, where then I broke off for my training took a different, uh, and my career took a different path was uh, I went down to the naval base in Talbolan and I started my naval training. So I'm an operations officer that consists of many different roles. Uh, I conduct, uh, do things such as gunnery operations, that's firing the main uh, armaments on the ship, the uh, 76 uh, millimeter cannon. Uh, I do navigation uh, up to the standard, up to a very high standard the Irish Naval Service conducts its navigation in. Uh, there's career courses available to you that you can do throughout the world. Um, other naval officers have been sent to Canada. That is uh, something that kind of rings true to the Irish Naval Service as well, is that uh, it's, it's very much, you get to see a lot of the world. I myself have uh, been deployed in the Mediterranean. Uh, I've got to go to Singapore, Australia, a lot of places uh, as part of my training. So just kind of bring it back to my training. Uh, after a year of kind of academics, uh, physical training, uh, you do a lot, of, um, a lot of physical training as part of the cadetship, uh, which kind of, from answering questions today, um, from, from people that kind of are concerned about the physical aspect of it. We don't expect everyone to be an outstanding athlete when they join the Naval Service, Defence Forces, uh, the Army or the Air Corps, wh whatever branch you're going to. But by the time the training is complete, you will be of a very high fitness standard. But it's not, it's not just thrown in the deep end. We will, we will bring you up there. And the fitness test uh, is just kind of like the base standard that we need you to be at. So if anyone does have concern for that, it's not it's not this overly daunting thing. It's, it can be dealt with easily, and uh, you're encouraged on throughout it. Um, so kind of a year then into my career, I was sent to the NMCI, which is the National Maritime College down in uh, Cork. Uh, I'm a self operations officer. I do three years of college there uh, to train to be a deck officer on, uh, on, a sh on a ship. So my qualification basically means that I can drive any type of ship in the world, whether it be an oil tanker, a cruise ship, or a my case, I drive warships, which is quite quite a good job in my opinion. I've enjoyed it. It's, it's a good career. Uh, it's very varied in what you do. Uh, this time last year, I was preparing myself uh, to go down to Operation Sophia, which was the humanitarian mission uh, conducted by the European Union uh, down in the Mediterranean, which is dealing with the, the migrant crisis in North Africa. Um, seen some very interesting stuff, uh, to say the least. Um, 
whether it be uh, down off the coast of Libya uh, in the middle of the night, getting to see the coast of Tripoli, just off uh, de dealing with uh, kind of being patrolling down there, or even then up to, to just getting to see the Straits of Gibraltar, navigating in through kind of some of the most uh, kind of famous uh, nautical uh, uh, passages in the, in the world. Then uh, what else that we uh, kind of pr uh, provide uh, then? Operation sites, my uh, site. Then there's the engineering site, which is also available. So, so if you're either um, kind of a, a graduate in engineering or a school, a school leaver looking to pursue a career, the naval service will provide you with training to become a ship's engineer. So that's dealing with the, the systems on board. So that's uh, your main engines, your generators, or the hospitality things. Uh, when a ship goes to sea, you need fresh water for, and you need to keep your uh, food. Uh, it's, it's quite a complex uh, logistic operation and uh, you need many traits and skills to bring the whole operation together. So I spent then, I got commissioned after two years, so I got commissioned as an ensign, which is uh, kind of, I became a, a kind of junior officer in the Defence Forces. And then my training took me off as part, uh, to, I went off to the Far East and then I done three months there uh, with a merchant uh, company named Amico, who's based out of Dublin here. Um, was interesting, got to see a lot of the world, came back then and uh, I done my training off the coast of Ireland. After my uh, degree, uh, I then proceeded on to uh, become the navigation officer and eventually the gunnery officer on board uh, the Ellie James Joyce, which is one of the new Irish naval ships. I spent uh, two years on board that and uh, this is, uh, I came ashore then to work uh, in a desk job, which is the thing about a career in the Defence Force in itself, it's a very rewarding experience, but it's very varied. There's so much that you can be asked to do as an officer in the organisation. Um, and the way your basic military training, whether you start off as a cadet, it kind of gets you in a mind frame where you can deal with anything that's presented to you because it's, it's, it's the training that's, because of the robustness of the training. You're asked to do something, it's not, it's, it, you, you break it down into a logical, uh, like how do I go about this and what needs to be done. It's, it's not, I can't do this, I will do this, and this is how I'm going to do it. So, just with that kind of being said, uh, is anyone any questions about the naval service? And uh, I'll try to answer them for you. No, nope, okay. I'd uh, pass on to the next speaker then, uh, who will uh, talk to you about the uh, Irish Air Corps. Good afternoon. So, my name's Lieutenant Christopher Jevons of the Irish Air Corps, so the air component of the Irish Defence Forces. Um, so, the question I suppose we hear a lot is what does the Air Corps do? Um, so as the air component of the Irish Defence Forces, I suppose our obvious role is to contribution for state security and the security of, of the Irish state. Uh, but also the Air Corps and the Defence Forces are kind of a, a multi-tool of asset of the Irish state. So we perform other roles on behalf of various government agencies, so whether that be ministerial air transport and the government jet, fisheries patrol in conjunction with the naval service for security of Irish international waters. And also uh, for uh, surveillance and uh, support of on Garda Síochána. So I'm a pilot officer within Number 3 Operations Wing, which is the helicopter operations of the Irish Air Corps. And within Number 3 Operations Wing, we support the, the Gardaí through the operation of the Garda Air Support Unit, so the Garda Heli flying around the city. That's us, the Emergency Air Medical Service, so Emergency Air Ambulance Operations, also conducted by the Air Corps, um, along with again through contribution to security of the state, cooperation with the army and the special forces operations within the army. So my story, uh, I joined as a school leaver into the pilot cadetship which is open at the moment for the Irish Air Corps. Again put a train with the army cadets uh, through the process that Alexander brought you through earlier on and then back to Baldonnell so our HQ is in Casement Aerodrome Baldonnell just uh, by City West here in Dublin. So the Pilot training consists of theoretical ATPL training, um, which is the international civilian standard uh, for theoretical training for um, for commercial pilots. So that's the base le base level education you get, and then you go through flight training on the Pilatus PC9 training aircraft. On completion of training, then you're uh, issued with your military pilot's wings, but also you're uh, accredited with a commercial pilot's license. So within the Air Corps, obviously. The flight training is completely funded and free. Um, you're paid for your training and paid for your accommodation throughout. And then you get a accredited um, commercial pilot's license at the end of it. Now, there is an undertaking of 12-year service within the Air Corps. 
and beyond your training, the roles you've, you're going to take place or, or carry out are what we've just gone through there. So for me, I went to helicopter operations wing. So after completing training on fixed wing aircraft, it then took about 12 months to train on helicopters and then onto the larger uh, AW139 helicopter types. So I'm qualified on both at the moment. So a, a pilot on EC135 are helicopter operations that we use for guard air support. And then the air ambulance helicopter, um, the AW139 uh, at the moment. So typical career or day in the life for myself. Uh, so I would do it two weeks of the month uh, on emergency air ambulance services in Athlone. So we're down there, we're on 365 day um, uh, response and we're there 12 hours a day on behalf of the National Ambulance Service to respond to emergency medical calls. Back in Baldonnell then, where I spend the other two, two uh, weeks in a month, we conduct either mostly training and also that's where our guard air support is based from and we'll also conduct uh, co cooperation with the Army, whether that be uh, surveillance or cooperation with the Navy, whether it be surveillance in, in the maritime domain as well. So I suppose I'd like to know if anyone has any questions about applying for a pilot cadetship within the Air Corps and becoming a pilot within the Air Corps, if anyone has any interest. So the age limit for the Air Corps cadetship is 18 to 26. So minimum 18 to 26 um, for either Irish nationals, EU nationals, or uh, anyone with uh, residency within the Irish state, um, graduates or non-graduates, school leavers as well. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name's uh, Colin at Barry Ryan. Um, I'll be a few more miles on the clock compared to my more youthful colleagues here, so I'm not going to give you my complete life story. Uh, suffice to say, uh, I'm an Army Engineer Officer. I've served in both infantry and uh, engineer appointments. I've served overseas in Liberia, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, most recently in Sierra Leone in the time of the Ebola crisis, and I'm going to Syria for a year in uh, July. What I'm currently doing at the moment is I work in the Directorate of Engineering in Defence Force Headquarters. And what I want to talk to you about, if it comes up in the slide, is what we're calling the Army Engineer Graduate Program. And very briefly, what it is essentially is we're looking for engineer graduates. Uh, to join the Army Engineer Corps directly. When you go onto the, the cadetship website, you will see that there are specific cadetships for Army engineers, Army ordnance officers, and also naval engineers, but I'm, I'm not going to speak to that just at this moment. So if you have an engineering degree or a building services qualification or certain science degrees and the details are on the website, you may well qualify for this program. So very quickly, what the first stage is, it, well, what it is in essence is it's an elite leadership program for engineers. Okay, so if you successfully complete it and go through it at that point, you will have managed to lead a team, you'll have made an impact, and not only will you have made a difference, you'll have been the difference, which for us is, 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 is a significant point. The first phase, it essentially it lasts five years, but that said, you, you can leave at any time, so you're not contractually bound for five years, it's just the various stages in, in the process. The first stage, as was mentioned already by Alex, is to apply for the cadetship. So you apply to be either an Army Engineer Cadet or an Army Ordnance Cadet, and you go through essentially world-class leadership training in the best leadership school in the country, which is the Cadet School where Alex is at the moment. There you're going to learn all the, the basic military skills you need to lead a platoon of 30 people, but you're also going to learn a whole pile of intangible skills around leadership, around motivation, around communications. And for most people, any, any, any degree you do now, even masters you're doing at the moment, I'm doing a postgrad at the moment, they're going to... They're, those skills are going to erode over time. In the next 10, 20, 30 years, you're going to have to continue to do, continually do professional development to stay current within your technical field. But it's the intangible skills that you have as a person, as a leader, as a communicator, etc. that are going to give value to you as you progress through in, in, into either your military career or as a civilian if you decide to leave. And that's where the real value of the cadet school is for us in terms of the, the quality of the, the character development and the, the personal development skills that you get in, in that phase. The second element then is if, if, you, if you are successful and if you complete the cadetship after 15 months, you will then be commissioned as a lieutenant. You'll get a significant pay bump and you will go directly to the School of Military, Military Engineering in the Curra, which is part of the Combat Support College. And there you'll undergo what we call a Young Officers course. And that Young Officers course gives you a level nine masters at the end of it. So essentially you're getting a free masters and you're getting paid to do it. So there's a whole range of academic subjects as part of that, but you'd also learn military skills such as bridge building, mine warfare, explosive demolitions, field fortifications, water purification, power supply, etc. to the point where you'll not only be able to act as a combat engineer, 
but you can deploy you can deploy overseas and be in a position to construct a camp, essentially a small town from scratch, to be able to support 500 to 1,000 to 1,000 soldiers. Um, the second element of it then is what you'll see, and you'll do this the following years. So there will be a gap. We'll go back to a unit to get some experience. It's what we call the maintenance engineering course. And that's because aside from the combat element of, of military engineering, we also look after all the military infrastructure in the country and the naval base and the Air Corps. So there you're going to be studying um, not only design elements, but you're going to be doing project management. You're going to be doing tender preparation, contract supervision, and all those other specifically technical engineering tasks you'll be required to do um, as, as part of your job back here in Ireland. Thereafter, after that two-year phase, when everything, when you've, you've been qualified, you will then go back to a unit where you'll take all the elements from the leadership training and cadetship and the technical elements from the YO's course, and you will, you will go back and you'll spend a year implementing those skills, but more particularly honing your leadership skills with troops in a unit. Um, it, it's not as easy as it sounds, but the training will get you to that point, but it gives you a tangible preparation and you learn more from your troops sometimes than you will do from, from the study you've had up to that point. And the culmination then is when you get to go overseas in charge of a platoon of 30 engineers as part of an eng of a Irish battalion of generally about 400 to 500 troops. And as I said, you're going to be responsible in camp for maintaining that base, perhaps even having to construct that base. But you'd also go out in patrols. You'd be doing military combat tasks such as bridge assessments. You'd be using explosives to uh, particularly when I was in Liberia, it was to blow up fallen trees, etc., to enable your troops to move. Um, and that, that's what we're really getting out of. The whole point of the five years to that point is to get you to a position where you can lead people in harsh and challenging environments and where you can actually make a difference to the population uh, that happen to live there, but also to enable your troops and the rest of your unit to fulfill their mission uh, for, the, for the wider UN in that regard. Thereafter, that's the end of our program per se. You can choose to stay in the military and then there's, there's more phases where you get promoted again, you'll go overseas again, you'll do more professional development courses, etc. Or if you do decide to leave, all those intangible skills are a massive force multiplier when you try, or sorry, when you go out to apply for civilian employment. We understand in today's environment, people are not looking for a job for life. We understand that people are going to many careers uh, throughout their working life. And what we're saying from this is that if, you, if you're willing to come into us, you're good enough, if you pass all the training and you then decide to leave, you can take all the skills back to the civilian world, but also you're going to be far ahead of your peers because of those experiences, because uh, in your mid to late 20s, you've led troops, you've led 30 people overseas, you've dealt with incredibly difficult environments, but also very challenging problems without the time or the resources to meet them. And those type of skills, regardless of the technical aspect, are the type of things you can only get through experience and you will be far ahead of your civilian contemporaries at that point if you do. So very, that is the, the basis of what we're, what we're talking about. I appreciate there's probably a lot to take in in about three or four minutes. I'd happily take any questions, but... Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so when I was in Liberia, so I have a degree in civil engineering in, in addition. Um, when I was in Liberia, we were responsible for we, we water purification plants. They worked in reverse osmosis for providing water to our base. So we were responsible for that. We also had generators for power supply. We had sewage plants for wastewater treatment. And essentially any, anything you take for granted in your house, your home, your town, your city, we had to provide in situ. Um, when I was in Liberia, sorry, in Sierra Leone, I worked in the Ebola treatment center. I was a consulting engineer. I was attached to the embassy, but essentially I was, I was lent out as a consultant to, um, to Goal and Concern and to other NGOs. So again, we wouldn't have used salination plants, but we would have dug wells. We would have built everything to local standards to in order that they could be maintained when we left, as well as implementing the, the very rigorous health standards that were imposed given the, the nature of the Ebola virus. So there was a double challenge of trying to deal with the local conditions, the local materials, but yet provides a solution that was sustainable and that met WHO standards going forward. So I don't know if that answers your question, but bottom line, that would be one aspect of what we do. Well, I assume you're going to do a wider context, but sort of useful functions in terms of what you do,
I says, the, the, the first issue to address is we're not an NGO. That's not our primary purpose. So our main reason, our primary purpose for being there is to fulfill a UN, UN mandate. And more often than not, it's that ourselves and other military units from other countries are in location to provide a safe and secure environment for other people, such as NGOs, civil society, or perhaps if, if things have been particularly bad in that location, for, for local government to be re-established. After that, um, we are then in the position to, to do uh, what we call quick impact projects, or sometimes we get funding from the Department of Foreign Affairs or from Irish Aid that we, we can also implement. But it isn't our primary function. But there is, that is certainly a component. And in every mission I've been on, there has been, um, we have done projects uh, that have specifically helped uh, people in the locality of our base, or when we patrol to provide medical assistance, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a component, but it's not our primary purpose. I have to say, it makes a real frisson of excitement to have somebody talking about going on missions at Jobs Expo. Uh, there's a gentleman here down the back has a question. I think we may have to, this may have to be our last question. Hello, sir. Thank you again, Ruth. Um, as in, thank you so much for all your presentations there. I'll make this quick. Um, would your engineering units be considering individuals who come from a previous background as a medical stroke clinical engineer in the clinical environment, in hospital-based environments? As in, is that an option at all? Um, well, we do have, we, we have a medical core, and we have medical officers who are qualified doctors of various specialities. We also have uh, medical technicians uh, who primarily are EMTs um, and advanced paramedics. Um, in, in terms of technical lab facilities, uh, the scale of our organization is such that we wouldn't deploy hospitals to that extent. And when we do require people with lab experience, we, we invariably will hire them directly from the civilian world under civilian contracts. But certainly there, there's a lot of opportunities in the medical corps for people who have medical qualifications. And uh, if you want any further information, it should all be on the website. That's what we do. We are not recruiting on a rolling basis for that. But if you keep monitoring it, you'll see when, when various roles become um, 